Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see you all here as part of our Bendelow Lecture Series in the Department of Plant Science. We have an esteemed guest here who's going to give us a lecture today. And I'm here to introduce him. My name is Nazem Chichek. I'm the Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences and the host of our seminar series and uh, our conversation series. It's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Ian Baldwin uh, to this lecture series. Uh, Dr. Baldwin is a professor and founder and director of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, where he studies, let me get this right, the Nicotiana attenuata as a model organism to understand how plants solve ecological problems. Dr. Baldwin received his bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology from Dartmouth College in 1981 and started his graduate studies at Cornell University where he joined the section of neurobiology and behavior. After graduating in 1989, he became a professor in the Department of Biology at State University of New York, Buffalo. He foresaw the importance of combining multiple disciplines to study plant ecology, and in 1996, he co-founded the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, a multidisciplinary center to study the chemically mediated interaction of plants. For his scientific contributions, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2013, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2016. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Ian Baldwin. Thank you, Lizzie. It's a real pleasure being here. It's a real pleasure being amongst colleagues who work on something real and important. Um, and I want to contrast that with the sort of things that we do in the Max Planck Society, which is entirely pure research. We have no requirements for application, um, and therefore we can go on to tangents that seem perhaps frivolous to those, um, um, yeah, perhaps frivolous, we'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a fairly high velocity talk if I can uh, overcome that beautiful lunch that I had, and uh, cover a number of the things that we've been discovering with this particular plant, which I'll introduce in a moment, this Nicotiana attenuata, and thank you for that completely correct uh, pronunciation of that, of that genus and species. It's a native tobacco plant of the uh, Great Basin Desert. And as you can see, there are many co-authors on this talk um, whose names I uh, will only have a chance to um, comment on as we go through the slides. Um, uh, I understand there'll be a breakout meeting tomorrow uh, for three hours, so I'm hoping that if I move too fast through some of these topics, we'll be able to unpack some of them during tomorrow's uh, discussion. So if you are interested in some details or confused about something, please uh, don't hesitate to join that. Um, Okay, so what it, I need to say something a little bit about the Institute. So the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology is one of the 85 Max Planck Institutes um, throughout Germany, and I got a chance to found one in the former East to help sort of redress the scientific imbalance that occurred after the Vende, after the rejoining of East and West Germany. Um, this institute, um, uh, as Nazim pointed out, it started in 1996. Um, we built this building and moved into it in 2002. And our main uh, goal really was to, at least in my department, was to um, convert chemical ecologists into a species of scientists that I like to call the genome-enabled field biologist. And what I mean by that, and here I have the sartorial representations of these different disciplines. Um, Chemical ecology is a, is a mashup of ecology and chemists, right? So here we have, you know, the classical chemist and the classical ecologist with their Birkenstocks. Um, that's actually Fritz Müller who, um, who coined Müllerian mimicry and among other classical ecological phenomena. Um, but with the ability of molecular biology to manipulate, to manipulate the chemistry uh, by manipulating the genes responsible for the chemistry that plants and insects use to interact in, in nature, uh, we of course wanted to bring molecular biologists on board. Um, this, of course, was before the first plant genomes were sequenced, um, so we had to do a number of, a bit of thinking about what we wanted to um, 
uh, study in terms of model systems and develop for this system. And the one thing nice about the Max Planck Society is that we're given long-term patient funding, so we're able to really lay out a 20-year plan, and I'm going to sort of give you a, a perspective on uh, what we managed to do um, in that 20-year period. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the type of science we do, because as you know, science can ask questions at many different levels of analysis, and in very general terms, there are the how questions and the why questions, and 99% of all scientists ask how questions. How do things work? What are the mechanisms that are involved? But a certain fraction of them ask questions of that, that are really of the why sort. Um, what are the uh, evolutionary consequences of a particular trait? Uh, how does the trait influence an organism's Darwinian fitness? And if you're interested in genomics, um, just about every gene that isn't pseudogenized in a genome has some influence on an organism's uh, Darwinian fitness. It helps to move that organism's genome forward in time, helps to produce successful grandchildren, which is what Darwinian fitness is really all about. Um, and chemical ecologists have always straddled that line because um, by synthesizing and, and purifying the chemistry that is involved in ecological interactions, they're able to manipulate them independently of the organisms that are involved. And of course, when you bring molecular biology into the boil, you can do that via the organism. And so what we do in this department really is to understand not mechanism for the sake of mechanism, but mechanism for the sake of understanding function. And so what we do is we typically delve deep enough into the mechanism of something so that we can generate a genetic manipulation and then ask the question of what are the functional consequences? What are the consequences for the organism's Darwinian fitness of doing that? And in doing so, we can answer why questions. Why do organisms have particular traits? So I wanted to say something about the plant that we chose. Um, and this is a plant that I've been working on since my graduate days at Cornell. It's a native uh, tobacco plant. Um, and it has the characteristic of chasing fires in ecological time. So it hangs out in the seed bank for 400 years between fires. And then it responds to factors in wood smoke um, and then germinates and grows. It's an annual plant for a short period of time, utilizes that post-fire environment, um, and then goes back into the seed bank waiting for the next fire to come along. And as a consequence, it grows in that very niche that we grow most of our agricultural plants. The, the, uh, Slash and burn agriculture was the foundation of agriculture, and uh, this is a plant that has been growing in that niche for four million years or so. And so the whole idea was to understand what sort of traits this plant had evolved to be able to fit into that niche so that hopefully we'd be able to make our crop plants ecologically more sophisticated, requiring fewer inputs, fewer things that are end up damaging the environment, um, and perhaps you know, be able to regulate their, their activities more um, um, with less pampering. So this whole business of chasing fires really all has to do with perceiving chemistry in the environment. So the plant um, sniffs out the various terpenes that the dominant vegetation produces and then maintains its dormancy as a consequence of sniffing those particular terpenes. We don't know anything about the mechanism of that sniffing process, but after a fire and those terpenes are pyrolyzed and removed, there are factors in wood smoke that includes the keratins, but a bunch of other factors that are um, smoke compounds, phenolic origin, that activate um, uh, keratin signaling and stimulate gibberellin biosynthesis and, and activates germination. So that's, what, that's how this plant synchronizes its germination after fires. That's how it chases fires. And the main question we wanted to really ask here was, uh, why do these plants make so many interesting secondary metabolites? What are all these different types of specialized chemistry uh, uh, doing in a plant? What are they doing with that chemistry? Um, this is a plant, as I, as I mentioned, um, that it typically solves its problems uh, through this chemistry. Plants can't move around, so they use their chemistry to manipulate all the organisms that they interact with, and they use their chemistry for that. Um, but little was understood in how they do that, and this is what we wanted to explore in the system, the, the, the whole process of solving ecological problems. Now, I'm gonna talk heavily about a particular signaling cascade that activates a large fraction of many sectors of this particular secondary metabolites. Um, and it's called the jasminate signaling uh, pathway. And it's a pathway that many of you are familiar with, but with the, the homologous series in animals, namely the prostaglandins. The uh, prostaglandins start out with a 20 carbon, four double bonded arachidonic acid, which goes through a series of chemical reactions to make this thing called prostaglandin that 
activates when you are wounded and you have infection and it, and it stimulates pain. Well, there's an exactly similar sort of pathway in plants. It starts out with the 18 carbon, three double bonded linolenic acid, which is then goes through a number of steps to make this ja uh, compound called jasmonic acid, which is then uh, activated by a conjugation with an amino acid. And then this forms a signal molecule, which then activates a whole series of, of secondary metabolite productions um, and is part of this environmentally sensitive system. So I'm going to talk a good bit about that. Now, our main question really was to ask, how does Nicotiana attenuata solve its problems with its chemistry? Um, bitter living through chemistry, and chemistry is really the only way that that plants can solve problems. Um, um, and I will give you some examples of that. And we wanted to develop platforms, metabolomics and ecological phenotyping and genetic platforms that were unbiased to be able to ask these questions from an unbiased perspective. Not so that we were anthropomorphizing this plant, but really phytomorphizing ourselves to be able to understand what this plant was doing. Um, now, the unbiased chemistry was fairly easy to do because during this 20 year period, thanks to Moore's law, mass spectrometers got faster and faster and able to capture a much larger fraction of the metabolites coming out of it. And I've always been interested in mass spectrometry, so we've bought just about every type of mass spectrometer possible and utilize that to characterize the the metabolomes of plants. In the beginning, it was mostly very targeted mass spectrometry going after particular metabolites, but then it developed uh, uh, when we got used to being able to massage the enormous amounts of data that each one of these runs would generate, be able to do unbiased, uh, untargeted metabolomics on, on these plants. Um, and it's really thanks to uh, a number of really key people in the group, Emmanuel Gagaral and Dapeng Li, who, who developed a lot of the infrastructure for that uh, unbiased metabolomics. Um, Emmanuel is now a, a professor at, at Strasbourg, and uh, Dapeng Li is a group leader in um, Shanghai. Um, the uh, unbiased ecological phenotyping was a little bit more challenging because it involved building an 8,000 kilometer corridor between the institute in Germany and the field sites where we were allowed to do transgenic plant releases, which were the native habitats where this plant grows. And we were very fortunate to develop um, a number of good relations with both the University of Arizona and with Brigham Young University, um, who have an, uh, a couple of uh, nature preserves that we were able to do transgenic plant releases in, and we've been doing that for the past 25 years. Um, we were fortunate to have the um, David Attenborough's BBC film team out um, a couple of years ago, and uh, we got some footage here to give you some ideas about what this field site looks like. Um, if you have seen uh, the Green Planet, which just came out this spring, um, we have about 15 minutes in episode four of the Green Planet. Um, if you, and then you, I'll show a couple more clips from this, uh, uh, this movie thing, and you can get all the, sort of the music and all the other Attenborough uh, additives to, this, uh, to these clips. But if you fly to Las Vegas, which is our nearest site, um, our nearest airport, and you look out the window on the right-hand side and look down, you can see our field station. Basically, it's located down in this particular canyon. Um, uh, to the, to the uh, west, we have Area 54. Um, and to the east is a whole series of polygamous uh, communities. Um, so it's very isolated. We don't have a lot of neighbors. Um, uh, the nearest uh, paved road is 70 miles away. Um, and we have a couple of field st uh, sites down there where we have some irrigation, where we do the planting. And of course, we use natural populations when the fires allow us to do so. Um, and the regulatory agencies allow us to do releases there for particular questions. And sometimes we have to manipulate pollinators like with these Ku Klux Klan hats that we put on plants sometimes. But the basic procedure that we do is to allow the organisms that phenotype plants better than we do to do the phenotyping for us. Because every time we generate a transgenic plant that is knocked out in a particular pathway or a particular signaling system, they typically don't have a phenotype in the glasshouse. They don't look any different from a normal wild type plant. But once you put them out into nature and you allow the organisms that interact with this plant on a regular basis, they show up a phenotype for us. So what we've basically done is try to train our students to do old-fashioned natural history, look at the organisms that actually study this plant carefully and do a better job of it. So we're basically using 
nature here as a laboratory for studying gene function. Um, and, um, and I'll tell you a number of examples of this, and I'll start with some obvious ones and then move more uh, into some things that are perhaps less obvious. Um, it is a tobacco plant, uh, after all. And it is a plant that um, the five Native American tribes who have incorporated this plant into their ceremonies and buried their dead with seeds of it have used it because it produces absolutely God's amounts of nicotine. Um, and uh, one single leaf will, when it's fully induced, will have the same amount of nicotine as an entire carton of Gulwa's cigarettes. Um, and uh, so you just have to take one good hit and you were communing with your ancestors. Um, <laughs> and nicotine obviously is, is an absolutely perfect anti-herbivore defense compound. It's a defense compound because plants don't have nervous systems so they don't get poisoned by it. But it poisons the neuromuscular junction. So any organism that has a muscle, chews, moves, is going to be poisoned by this. And, um, and if you knock out nicotine production by silencing one key gene, putrescine methyltransferase, that I've got an X on the top of it, you can knock down nicotine production. And when you put those plants out into the field, the deer, the mule deer that are in the neighborhood immediately find it. Gophers dig holes over to it and, and pull it down into their nests. Rabbits chew off the outer bark of it and, and strip it. So you get an immediate response from the mammalian uh, herbivore community um, that tells you just how important that metabolite is for the daily existence of these plants. But as in all cases in nature, there are, of course, insects out there that have really figured out how to break through nicotine and are completely nicotine tolerant. And this is one of them. This is Manduca sexta, Manduca quinca maculata. It has the world record for nicotine tolerance. Um, and uh, even uses nicotine for its own defense, something that we, we discovered. And what we were interested in was how does the plant deal with this particular insect that has broken through this fantastic defense barrier. So it's exactly a crop plant situation. You transform your crop plant with a wonderful anti-herbivore compound, you know, and after a few years, you've evolved resistance in your, in your favorite pest. And so what does the plant, what does a native plant do when that happens, when, it, when somebody breaks through it? Well, the whole story starts up with this little bit of slimy stuff on the cut edge of the leaf there that the caterpillar was chewing. Um, that's caterpillar spit. Um, and in caterpillar spit are a series of molecules called fatty acid amino acid conjugates. And these are the herbivore activated elicitors. These are the ones that tell the plant that it's being attacked by Manduca sexta and not any other of about 30 other lepidopteran species that will attack it. And then the plant begins to respond accordingly. And what I want to do in the next few minutes here is tell you about what does the plant do when it knows it's being attacked, that the wound that is that is happening on this particular leaf is coming from this particular herbivore. And what does it do? And it does some remarkable things. It basically activates a signaling cascade in which the central component of that signaling cascade is the jasmine signaling uh, part of it. So these FACs at the top there are perceived by a receptor, which we still have not yet identified, activates this beautiful kinase cascade, and then it pumps right into jasmine signaling through the plastid and generates the jasmatic acid, which I showed you the structure of, conjugated to isoleucine um, to form this J-isoleucine, which is then um, perceived by us a, a protein sandwich between one of 12 jazz proteins and a koi protein, which then transduces the signaling into the, all the beautiful chemistry that the plant will make. Of course, as we talked yesterday, there's an awful lot of crosstalk between other phytohormones, and there's a bunch of other things that are also piece of other phytohormone signaling that's also perceived by those FACs, ethylene signaling, salicylate signaling, and the like. And these are all part of making sure that the plant doesn't get faked out by other signals that are in caterpillar spit. Caterpillars, after all, do not brush their mandibles before they eat a leaf, and therefore there is a lot of microbes, and those microbes are introduced into wounds as they chew, and you don't want the plant to be activating the salicylic acid antipathogen response, which would then thwart the jasminate uh, mediated defense signaling that the, that the plant's producing. So there's, there's some tuning uh, through phytohormonal crosstalk um, uh, in this process. Um, and there's a beautiful receptor called LEC-RK that, that mediates that. Okay, so what does all this signaling do? Um, it basically revamps the plant's defense, avoidance, and tolerance responses. And I'm gonna very quickly run through those examples of those three types of responses. These are all things that are activated de novo 
by caterpillar feeding when those FACs are introduced. So as I go through this, you just have to remember that all of this doesn't happen in the plant until those FACs are introduced into wounds and then transduces this particular signaling. And the first thing I want to do is to talk about the tolerance responses. Um, I consider this sort of the Mahatma Gandhi approach toward dealing with your, your oppressors, that you figure out a way to tolerate it and then rebound and go on uh, with your life. Um, and this was actually discovered through a very pure natural history observation. I spent a lot of time walking through fields after lightning strikes and fires, and you see these natural populations bloom. And I've noticed that the plants that are heavily chewed on by caterpillars, like this plant here, that's being attacked by two full Manduka larvae. They're both in the third, fourth instar. It's going to be stripped fairly thoroughly. Those plants, at the end of the season when it dries down, start to reflower if we get a little uh, August rain. And they clearly have some extra reserves because none of the other plants reflower. It's only those plants that have been heavily stripped reflower during that time. And we were able to pin it down uh, using some very nice C11 uh, technology from a synchroton in, in Ulich, Germany, um, to be able to trace how carbon moves through a plant after a plant has been elicited by FAC signaling. So we simply elicit a plant with FAC signaling, use C11 CO2, and then look where it goes. And it turns out instead of going up to young leaves, which is the normal thing that a plant does, you know, it fixes carbon and makes new leaves, uh, transporting that photosimulate to grow new leaves, it pumps that fixed carbon down to the roots. And it keeps it in the roots until the caterpillars are gone. So basically, and this all works through a particular SNRK kinase. There's a beta subunit to the SNRK kinase, which is downregulated. It's actually responsible for that. We were able to transform plants, downregulate that SNRK kinase, and get plants with the exact same pattern of carbon to transport down to the roots um, as if they were elicited by these caterpillar spit factors. And the biological significance of this bunkering of carbon down into the roots is that Caterpillars have two stages in their lives. They have the eating machine stage when they're consuming leaf material, and then they uh, pupate and turn into a sex machine where they're basically having sex and laying eggs, and that's it in terms of, uh, of their damage to the plant. And during that time, when the caterpillar is in the eating machine stage of its life, it's bunkering carbon down to the roots, and then it waits for the caterpillars to go into their sex machine stage, fly off, um, and then the plant reflowers. And it reflowers much more effectively thanks to this bunkering response. So that's really the tolerance mechanism, the physiology of their tolerance to this particular herbivore. And that's elicited by FAC signaling. Okay, so that's the tolerance component of it. Um, they also activate an avoidance response. And you may be wondering, you know, how does a plant avoid um, being attacked by a caterpillar? Because plants don't tend to run away the way that most animals have avoidance responses. Um, but in order to understand this, you need to understand um, where the caterpillar comes from. The caterpillar is clearly the bad guy in this particular interaction but it is produced by a good guy. The mom of this caterpillar, the ovipositing female, is the main pollinator of this plant. Um, and this particular uh, um, female, the moth of this, has this unusual behavior that after it pollinates the flowers, this normally occurs in the, in the nighttime, you see it oviposit. It bends its abdomen, curls, and lays an egg. So it nectars and oviposits, nectars and oviposits. So every time it provides a bit of pollination services, it leaves a bit of bad news for the plant. <laughs> the bad news that grows into this voracious you know, caterpillar that eats plants and is completely resistant to nicotine. And the flower on the, the main type of flower this plant produces is completely adapted to this particular moth. You might have noticed it has a very long galea, a very long proboscis. Um, in order for the flower to be pollinated and for the moth to, to nectar on those flowers, it actually has to stick this very long galea that it unrolls as it flies along into the bottom of the flower and pollinate. And to do that, the flower has to be in an upright position. And you might have noticed that during that time series through the night, the flower waves and moves up into this up position and then it goes back down again during the day. That waving is absolutely essential for allowing the mechanics of the moth to be able to get its proboscis in. But there's another thing that occurs during the waving response. The corolla opens up. And during the opening up of that corolla, 
the flower starts emitting this beautiful scent that's made of a structure called benzyl acetone. The whole waving response happens in the peduncle, which is this little connection piece between the flower and the stem. And the peduncle, if you chop it off, waves by itself. It waves uh, automatically in the petri dish. And when you have this nice system, you can figure out how the waving system works. It turns out it's driven by components of the plant's circadian clock. Um, and that part of the circadian clock causes a, a redistribution of auxin across the ab and axial sides of it. So it's really a growth response. The, the ped peduncle is growing differentially, um, and it's very much like the nicknating behavior that Darwin described in his notebooks, if you've ever had a chance to read them. Um, uh, so this waving response is important, um, and the chemistry of the release of that floral scent is super important for this moth to find this plant. Now, um, the moth uses the chemistry, uh, which we've been able to knock out by figuring out the biosynthetic pathway. Uh, we call it chalcone synthase, but it actually turns out to be a polyketide synthase, so more correctly named uh, recently. We have an RNAi construct we've been able to, to knock that down with and produce flowers that do not make the scent at all. Um, and when that happens, the moth can't pollinate, they can't actually find it. But this whole coordination of chemistry and waving is a little bit like dirty dancing. The flower has to kind of get into the right position, release the right thing, otherwise the pollination doesn't occur. So this is a flower that is very specific for this particular moth. Um, and when you have a lot of herbivory, when this caterpillar chews away uh, on the plant and begins to damage it and is not taken out by a lot of the defenses that I'll be talking about a little bit later, and you get a lot of uh, FAC-based signaling, the plant does some very interesting things. It produces a different type of flower. But I want to, I want to just show you the importance of this, this, this uh, benzyl acetone emission because if you knock it out, the moths can't find the flowers, can't find the plants. Um, if you have night vision uh, photography, you can be able to see the moths flying by these plants that are not emitting and go directly to those uh, plants that are emitting. And it also turns out, we have a couple of papers on this too, that the tip of the proboscis has sensors for this benzyl acetone, and they use the, the proboscis basically to taste their way into the center of the flower. So the, the floral scent is important for long distance attraction of the moth, as well as the short distance orientation of the proboscis into the moth. So they basically can't do any pollination uh, without either them. Now, if I say the plant are being attacked by lots of caterpillars and the defenses aren't working, the plant makes a new type of flower. This new type of flower does not open up on that first night. That's called the night open flower is the one that opens up. And the morning open flower, as you can see in the top bar there, is the one that doesn't open, remains shut, does not wave, and does not scent. And this flower um, uh, uh, and that whole process is all mediated by FAC mediated jasmine signaling. It turns out the mechanisms all involve um, a hijacking of the, the clock, that mechanism that causes the waving by jasmine signaling. There are seven of the 14 jazz proteins that interact directly with ZTL portion of the clock, and that prevents this whole waving response from, from occurring. And so at the end, when the morning comes around, the flowers that are the morning open flowers have their fluted, are still closed, have not released any floral scent. They're full of nectar because they haven't been visited by moths the night before, and they haven't waved. And the nice thing about these flowers is that they are pollinated by a bird, a hummingbird, that does not lay caterpillar eggs. So it, it gets pollination services without having to have the, the deleterious consequences of having caterpillar eggs being laid on it. So this is one of the, this is an avoidance response. It's avoiding the whole problem of having caterpillars by switching to a different type of sexual system. Um, now you might be asking yourself, why doesn't it do this all the time? You know, why don't you just stay with the hummingbird? Well, it turns out the hummingbird is a lousy pollinator. It's a trap liner during this time. It's got a nest right over here. It comes through and just goes and moves pollen within the plant causing self-pollination. The hawk moth, on the other hand, is flying from 500 kilometers away from the last burn, bringing in a much more rich pollen source, and the offspring that are sired in those uh, pollinations by the, by the hawk moth have many more paternal genotypes in there. And if you are a seed that's got to live in the seed bank for 400 years, it's a very good idea to have a lot of genetic diversity. 
So that's, that's sort of the basic reason for, for why you want to stick with a moth um, as long as the moth isn't doing too much damage. And you can then avoid it if you have to um, and go to a, to a hawk moth. So that's, that's avoidance by chaining pollinators. And you know, in all this, plants have remarkably fluid sexual systems. And this is just one of those beautiful examples about how, how you can simply um, solve a major ecological problem by, by changing your sexual orientation. Now, the, the main part of our, our research has been really the bread and butter has been defense responses and the types of interesting chemistry that's involved in the defense responses. And I want to first talk about the indirect defense responses that plants use. And these are mainly the, the volatiles that plants produce, the things that are emitted from the plant after FAC signaling activates the plant. And the way it works is that when a caterpillar chews on a leaf, whether it be over here or there, the plant gets these signals that come into it and activate the production of a group of uh, sesquiterpenes. There's a beautiful bouquet of volatiles that the whole plant begins to emit from. It's like a Chanel number no. five. In fact, it, Chanel number no. five has 149 different structures in it. Um, or the volatile bouquet that's induced by caterpillar has 122 different structures in it. There's a couple key components that if you knock them out, you can take out this whole signaling component. The main one is this transalphalbergamotene that I have pictured up here in red. And transalphalbergamotene, uh, is a compound that attracts a beautiful little predator called Geochorus palins that lives in the soil nearby, many meters away. And when it sniffs uh, transalphalbergamotene, it comes running over to the plant and looking for the caterpillar. But it needs more information because the, 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 the predators are small, the caterpillars are small, the plants can be big, um, and you need some local guidance as to where the caterpillar is located. Um, and that's provided by the actual wounding of the of the leaf by the caterpillar's mandibles. And that gives off a green leafy volatile, a GLV, a six carbon uh, molecule, uh, which is then isomerized by the caterpillar spit to an even more active six carbon structure, which uh, attracts the predator. Now I need to talk a little bit about the chemistry here because I'm gonna return um, uh, to this in a, in a moment. So I told you that jasmine signaling involves the taking of this 18 carbon three, oops, double bonded uh, um, fatty acid. Um, to make jasmonic acid. And that's uh, mediated by a lipoxygenase called uh, LOX3. Um, in Arabidopsis, there's only one LOX, but in, in Nicotiana, there's two LOXs that do this job. One of them makes the jasmonic, the other one does, functions as a lyase, cleaving the hydroperoxide, the 13 carbon, uh, 13 hydroperoxide, into a C6 and a C12. The C6 forms this Z3 hexanel, which is a GLV, a uh, green leafy volatile, uh, which is attractive to the to the predator and provides the local information. But the caterpillar spit isomerizes that to make an even more active Z2 hexanel, which is really important, really easily perceived by these predators. And then they come right over and uh, attack, the, uh, attack the caterpillar. So we, we published this uh, in Science. It seems like an interesting observation that the, that the caterpillar spit would basically a call uh, much more effective predators to itself. Um, and I'll return to that inference in a moment. But here's David Attenborough's view on this. They took him three weeks to get this particular shot. The, you see the little predator being attracted by the volatile, coming up to a caterpillar, stabbing it, sucking it out. It's a perfect way to deal with your herbivores. You don't have to poison them. You just put out information. It's like calling the police. They come in, they feed much more effectively, they clean out your caterpillars. Um, uh, it's a, uh, indirect defenses really work. It's really impressive. Um, there are a number of different predators uh, that are on the plant that are attracted by those volatiles. Um, I won't go into all of them, but I wanna talk about a group of predators that are recruited from the ground. And it's a different type of chemistry that recruits those predators from the ground. This is also a type of indirect defense. And this is a, a, a defense called acyl sugars that are produced in trichomes. Trichomes are the little hairs on leaves that sometimes make a leaf sticky and they can actually form a sort of a, 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 a fly trap type of thing. You see insects being stuck on plants sometimes. But these little trichomes exude a sugary stuff from the top of it if they're secretory and they um, uh, consist of a a sugar molecule esterified with little fatty acids on the end of the hydroxyl groups of the sugar. Um, those hydroxyl groups, when the, when the sugar droplets are ingested, are cleaved and they release those fatty acids, giving the caterpillar a body odor 
of those fatty acids. And these are very volatile fatty acids. These are the, the scent of baby barf. If you have a baby, um, you'll frequently be smelling of this as it barfs on your shoulder and you burp them. Um, but these are the sort of the, the, you know, not so noxious, but quite, you know, olfactorily uh, active short chain fatty acids that are, that are released. Um, caterpillars, when they first hatch, they feed on these trichomes. The trichomes basically are their first meal. So when they ingest those, those acyl sugars, the very high midgut pH of the caterpillar's uh, midgut esterifies those fatty acids from the sugar molecules and the caterpillar starts getting this body odor. But not only does the caterpillar get a body odor, but the caterpillar's poop gets a body odor. So when the caterpillar poops, here's a pooping caterpillar, you might see that little pop, it falls to the ground, that nice redolent smelly frass falls onto a hot ground. This is Utah after all. The ground is 50, 60 degrees Celsius um, and it volatilizes off. And when you have a lizard trucking along on the ground or an ant trucking along the ground, they perceive those volatile fatty acids and believe it or not, ants think in three dimensions. They look up and they look for a, a caterpillar up on the plant. Lizards do the same thing. And so you see, you can do these experiments with oven dried frass that doesn't smell and a fresh frass that does smell and put it in the bottom of a stick and lizards will run up the stick with a fresh frass at the bottom. It, you can uh, purify or synthesize the fatty acids and make your own little spray um, sort of as a, you know, a perfume. It's going to be available in the duty free shops any moment now. Um, <laughs> Spray it at the bottom of the uh, of the stick, and you can get ants to run up the stick, um, looking for for caterpillars, um, and there they are charging up there. So basically, what happens is that this first meal, this lollipop that is served up on these little trichomes for caterpillars, is actually an evil lollipop because it tags them for predation. Um, so this is a, an example, another example of the type of chemistry that recruits. Uh, uh, higher trophic levels uh, and it functions as an indirect defense. Um, so those are, that's part of the chemistry that's involved in the indirect defense. The plants make all these other compounds that are really direct defenses and I'm going to just give you examples of a couple of them. Um, and I, you know, I have to be careful here because I can really bog down in the, in the, in the chemistry of it. I, I know when people's eyes start glazing over. But um, let me just tell you about some of them. These, these were some um, uh, compounds called HGLDTGs, diterpene glycosides. And they, uh, if you do a normal mass spec uh, LCMS, they sort of occupy a middle portion of this chromatogram. There's about 46 structures here. We, were only, we only had to characterize four of them uh, by classical NMR uh, three-dimensional characterization. The rest of them we could do by in-source fragmentation from, from mass spectrometry. Um, they are a diterpene backbone with a bunch of double bonds in them, functionalized on either end of that uh, diterpene, and then esterified with a bunch of sugars, uh, glucose or, or um, uh, arabinose, and then malate. Uh, and that's what generated the 14 different structures. Now, what is typical of secondary metabolism is that there has been a number of gene duplication events that allow for particular sectors of metabolism to, be, to evolve and neo-functionalize. And as with uh, um, the GGPSs that produce gibberellins, that produce carotenoids, there's been a duplication event and another GGPS is specialized for producing these diterpene glycosides. So all you have to do is generate an RNAi construct to knock out that particular GGPS and you can take the whole metabolic sector out. And when you do that and you feed caterpillars on them, you can see how fast they grow. They basically quadruple their growth rate if they're not eating plants with these diterpene glycosides in them. And if I showed you the plant, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They look completely normal. Put them out there and the caterpillars love them. They grow enormous and they grow much faster. So this is an example where the chemistry of um, the, the, these direct defenses is really all a matter of slowing the caterpillar's growth down. And it also turns out when we figured out the biosynthetic pathway of what happens to that particular diterpene as it leaves the plastid and has been functionalized uh, on the to both ends and gets decorated by these sugar molecules, we figured out why it's toxic. And it turns out that if the architecture of the pathway itself is what allows the plant to solve the chemical waste dump problem of chemical defense. The more potent a chemical defense is, the more poisonous it is, the more problematic it is going to be to make and store. And the way the plant solves it is to produce a biosynthetic pathway that keeps a certain reaction from happening. And it turns out 
decorating the molecule with particular sugars in particular places is exactly how it's done. If you take those sugars off or you don't allow the plant to make those particular sugar dishes, the plant immediately starts showing toxic symptoms and dying. Um, and the exact same thing happens in the caterpillar's midgut. The caterpillar ingests these diterpenes with the sugar things. It starts pulling those sugars off because it likes to digest sugars. And then it immediately starts to cause the, the diterpene to be hydroxylated in a number of different places. And that kills a central component in sphingolipid biosynthesis, which is toxic for, for the plant and for the caterpillar. So we unraveled, and this was published in Science last year, um, uh, the toxic mechanism by simply working out the biosynthetic pathway. It's another one of those beautiful examples where mechanism and function really come together very nicely. Okay, so what I was saying is that a lot of these direct defenses function to slow down caterpillar growth. And one of the classic uh, types of molecules are these protease inhibitors that plants produce. And the more protease inhibitor a plant produces, the less effective the caterpillar's digestive system is, the more it has to eat, the slower it grows. And when you keep the caterpillar small and slow it down by having to make it deal with all these toxins, you end up making it much more vulnerable to the predators. So let me just show you an, a visual example of this. Here's Mary Schumann, a, a former postdoc in the group, pretending to be a predator, poking a caterpillar who's feeding on a normal wild type plant, replete with all those defenses. And you can see the caterpillar is barely doing anything. It's getting poked, it's just sort of, you know, leave me alone. Uh, she's picking it up on the tail, it doesn't wiggle, it hangs there limp and flaccid. It's sort of a pathetic cat caterpillar. Contrast that with a caterpillar feeding on a defenseless plant. I'll show you in a moment how we make that defenseless plant. And you see a much more pugilistic caterpillar, a caterpillar that's able to fight back, turn around, spit at the, at the, at the uh, predatorial forceps um, and, uh, and defend itself. So this just shows you how effective this combination of both direct and indirect defenses are when you have a third trophic level component it. And this is something we do not do very well in agriculture. We do not really bring natural enemies in as effectively as we could. And so much of it is simply just a matter of providing information to those predators to let them know where the caterpillars are, where they're feeding, what they're doing. Um, and that's, I think, something we can do much more effectively. Um, uh, the, the last story is a little bit longer one, and, and it involves um, some brand new chemistry that we just uh, published in Science uh, last year. Uh, that solves a 20-year puzzle that we had. Um, and I'd like to describe very briefly this 20-year puzzle that we had. It involves a combination of both direct chemistry and indirect ch chemistry. The indirect chemistry were the GLVs that I already introduced, and the direct chemistry were a group of compounds called phenylamides, which are basically phenolic compounds with an amine of a putrescine um, uh, arginine uh, attached to them. Um, and we knew, they, we knew about their defensive uh, function already, but this combination was something that was involved in non-host resistance, and I think we found one of for the first examples of non-host resistance for an insect, um, particularly from a nat nat natural system. So 20-some years ago, uh, we released a group of uh, jasmate deficient plants who were knocked out in LOX3. Remember I told you LOX3 was the beginning of the jasmate signaling pathway? So it, it was deficient in jasmate signaling. We put these plants out into nature in the, in the nature preserve, and they were attacked, of course, by all the herbivores that we knew were herbivores on attenuata, but they were also attacked by a group of herbivores that we had never seen on attenuata before. Um, and one of them was this leafhopper, an Amboasca leafhopper, which uh, was clearly probing the plants much uh, without our knowledge of it. And then when they found a plant that was jasmine deficient, they started to feed on them. And they fed them, and they, this probing that, they, that these emboasca leafhoppers do elicits jasmine signaling too. Um, and to make a long story short, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was the reason why they were able to feed on a jasmine deficient plant. Was it because jasmine signaling was, was abrogated? itself, jasmine, the signal itself was the, was the defense molecule, or was it some molecule, some defense compound that the, that the jasmine signaling was elicited? So we took the three pathways that we knew were jasmine active, namely the protease inhibitors, the nicotine, and the DTGs, knocked them out, um, and then we knocked out all these other steps in the jasmine pathway all the way up to the, to the lipid that releases the, mem the, the 18 carbon molecule from the membrane to start jasmine biosynthesis. And we created a jasmine sink. This is how we made the ultimate defenseless plants. We simply 
overexpress a methyl transferate to conjugate jasmate with methyl, a group methylated, to make methyl jasmate, which is totally inactive. And then we knocked out the esterase that would cleave the methyl group from the methyl jasmate to make it back to jasmate again. So we basically created a sink, sucked all the jasmate out of the plant, volatilized it, got rid of it. And that made the plant totally you know, jasmine inactive. And then we planted all those different lines into a field. And in the bottom of the field, at the end of that plot, you see a nice green alfalfa field. Alfalfa turns out to be a nice host for these leafhoppers. Um, and then we mowed the, uh, the alfalfa field, drove the leafhoppers up into our plantation, and then quantified the damage. And it turns out they only damaged the jasmine deficient lines. They didn't care about the lines that we had knocked out nicotine protease inhibitors and nitroterpene glycosides. So we were thinking during this time that it must be simply that these were bloodhounds for identifying jasmine mutants. So we spent these, we used these insects basically to help us identify mutants of jasmine signaling the natural populations. We gather them up at night and release them into small populations and you could usually find one or two jasmate deficient plants in each of these native populations scattered throughout the desert. So that was great, but we really didn't understand very much about it and we certainly didn't understand any of the chemistry that was behind this. And it clearly required a different approach. It required a forward genetics approach because we had no idea where the, what the chemistry was. We had to let forward genetics guide us into what the chemistry was involved. So in order to do forward chemistry, you need a genome, all right? And I'll tell you, this was not easy because um, it's a pretty big genome, uh, 2.3 gigabases. It's replete with all sorts of little vial repeat elements. We struggled with the first generations of PAC bio sequencing because we could not get um, the DNA through those, those PAC bio pores. It turns out the secondary chemistry of the, of the, uh, of the plants, particularly those cytoterpene glycosides, clogs those pores. So we, we actually couldn't get any long reads to be able to do a decent assembly until we had knocked out the cytoterpene glycosides completely. With later generations of PAC bio, we were able to assemble uh, a better long read. We now have a chromosome level assembly, which you just published last month in PNAS. Uh, Richard Frey, a grad student, uh, was responsible for that. And then we generated, spent 10 years developing a four genetics real population. And we generated this magic population, which stands for a multi-parent advanced generation intercross, one that would basically capture a large fraction of the genetic diversity in Nicotiana population. So we went out and used my collection of about 420 different accessions of attenuata that I've been collecting for the past 30 years, uh, screened them for the 26 most variable parents, used those 26 parents to do uh, 26 by bivariate intercross, intercross them for four generations, seven generations of inbreeding to generate uh, this magic population, which we then would plant out and ask questions about um, like leafhopper chemistry. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the solution to that and how we got to the structure. So this is just a, um, a PCA of the genetics of, those, uh, of that magic population showing that um, the rills all tightly cluster, showing very little genetic structure. Here's the 26 parents. Um, and one of the problems about doing GWAS, of course, is you know that uh, population structure really uh, gives you an awful lot of false positives. So you have to get rid of the population structure, and this is exactly what this magic population does. Completely randomizes the genetic background, but captures all that genetic diversity in a nice structured population. And so we took this enormous uh, magic population, there are two replicates of 325 rills, and planted them out into the field to phenotype them for all sorts of traits. And we grew them in populations where we surrounded the, the magic population with the favorite natural host plant of the Emboasca leafhoppers. And then, of course, we harvested them, drove the leafhoppers into the magic population, and then tell, and tried to figure out what exactly was going on. And it was really the brilliance of um, an informatics person in the group that I already introduced, that Peng Li, who's now in Shanghai, who was able to network the eQTLs we got from that data, from that experiment, as well as the metabolite QTLs and the phytohormone QTLs together to come up with a particular structure, this structure right here, which has a molecular weight of 347, um, uh, which is the molecule that it was imputed most strongly by emboasca feeding. Um, and then to figure out how this molecule is actually made in the plant, because we, in order to test the hypothesis, we want to knock it out, we want to be able to um, put it into another plant. Uh, 
we managed to recruit a really wonderful synthetic biologist, Yu Chen Bai, who is at Fudan University now, who was able to reconstruct the entire pathway in yeast um, and using the smidgens of information that we were getting from this for genetic screen. And some of these, some of these uh, genes that were involved in the biosynthesis do not have very strong log scores. And I encourage you to read the science paper. I won't have time to go into it, um, but it involves some very interesting biosynthetic uh, chemistry. But the, the real gem here, and this is an example about how synthetic biology is going to be so important for this type of work, was that he was able to reconstruct the pathway in a natural host of the leafhoppers that doesn't have the chemistry, doesn't even have the phenylamines in there. So he put all the genes that were necessary into bean, which is one of those host plants, and was able to make bean completely toxic to leafhoppers. A bean which is a perfect host for leafhoppers in the past. And of course, we're very interested in this in an agricultural component. These leafhoppers are major pests of, of tea, and we're in the process of trying to, to reconstruct the pathway into, into tea plants and like. Um, but there was a, there's, a, there's a little point here I want to make that has to do with function, and again, the, my main take home message, which is the importance of field work. And that is, has to do with the biosynthesis of this particular molecule. So the, the molecule starts out with caffeoputrocine. There's two polyphenol oxidases that turn the phenol into a quinone, which activates it for the conjugation of the GLV, the six carbon unit, which also has to be activated by the polyphenol oxidase to make this conjugation process. The important point I want to make here is that the particular GLV is the Z3 hexanel not the Z2 hexanel. Now remember what I told you about the Z3. The Z3 is what's made upon wounding, and the caterpillar turns it into Z2, which then becomes a much more effective predator attractor. So that means that there is perhaps another interpretation than this one to why the caterpillar is doing that one that we're going to have to go back and revisit. And that interpretation is that there is an interaction between the leafhopper and Manduka about their resistance traits that we need to explore much more carefully. So again, this is an example where a functional interpretation is something that you need to constantly go back and revisit to see whether or not you actually have the story correct. Nature is just as complicated as what's going on in the Middle East right now, and it's very hard to come up with a clean interpretation based on a few laboratory experiments. Now, the last point I want to make, and, and just to end my, my, my story, is that at the same time when we were doing all this stuff with the Amboasca, we were also taking spit and eliciting the entire magic population with these FAC factors. And we were able to impute uh, a beautiful spit elicited uh, log score, which happened at the end of chromosome 5. Right there was a beautiful a large deletion in a gene called JAR4. Now, JAR4 is the one that does the conjugation of the isoleucine amino acid to jasminate to make the active signal molecule for jasminate signaling. So that means that in that magic population was a natural jasminate mutant that has this very large deletion in, uh, in this particular essential component of jasminate signaling. Now, what we've gone on to show, and I'm not going to show you the data because I don't have the time for this, um, is that these plants that lack jasmine signaling are, of course, defenseless. They can't make that beautiful molecule that I just showed you, but they also benefit from not having to do that when there's no herbivores around because they have enormous growth advantage. They can grow 20% faster than a normal wild-type plant simply because of the lack of defense drag that they have uh, from that. So there's this, there's this benefit, but an enormous cost uh, to, to having this. And um, we also were able to troll a seed collection that I had made when I was a graduate student. So this is an important message for all graduate students. Do not throw away your samples. <laughs> 30 years later, this turned out to be the key thing that made this a PNAS paper. And we were able to show that this major mutation was located in a particular portion of Utah and had been there representing 30%, 70% of some populations for at least 10 years. And if you know anything about evolutionary biology and R.A. Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural uh, selection, you realize that this should not happen. This is a major mutation, a single gene major mutation with big fitness effects that is persisting in a natural population. R.A. Fisher, who I have right here smoking away, and, uh, predicted that that should not occur because all, all, all those type of mutations should have been driven to, to fixation very rapidly. 
And we've spent most of the paper that uh, we just published in PNAS on this trying to understand how this major mutation is buffered by a whole by the gene network that is in, in which it is balanced. And I don't have the time to go into all of this, um, but the point that I want to make, and really my ending point here, is that it's basically never too late to do field work. And field work with a natural system puts everything into a context that is outside of the human intellectual construct. And it's great that theory predicts that something shouldn't happen, but when it does happen, one should go back and think about the theory. And I, I need to thank some um, funding agencies, the Mount Clark Society and a bunch of other funding agencies who fund this work, uh, the Brigham Young University, who have, for the past many years, has allowed us to do releases uh, at their nature preserve, and a whole lot of people who uh, generated some amazing videos that I, that I showed you here. And you for your attention. Any questions? What an excellent talk. Any questions for you, Dr. Baldwin? Uh, just realized that body odor can kill, so you better shout. <laughs> yeah, amazing talk. Um, it's an incredibly complex system, and really there's different defense mechanisms that are involved and strategies on the part of the plant. And yet, the plant doesn't have much opportunity to reproduce and transmit genes around from what I understood. You said that. It's only when fire happens every hundred years or something. Well, it, uh, with brome grass invasions, it's happening every four years now. Um, so there, so there's, there's actually mess, it's of, faster uh, cycling. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. On an yeah. annual basis, yeah. is there uh, that kind of uh, diverse strategy in, in plants that um, sort of uh, reproduce more often, have more generations per year? It seems to me to be a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, different strategies when there's not really much opportunity for that to be selected for. Oh, I think there's plenty of opportunity for these things to be selected for. I think, you know, you're, you're thinking about agricultural time. You know, four million years has a lot of generations in it. Yes. And, and you can select for things pretty quickly. And I think there's, a, there's also enormous amount of genetic diversity in these natural populations. This is one of the great things about having uh, species that can escape in time this way. The populations are incredibly genetically diverse because you've got things that were growing four years ago with things growing 100 years ago all coming up in the same population. So there's a lot of genetic material there to select among. It's just a question of how strong the selection differential is uh, for the particular traits. Um, so um, I think one should never underestimate the power of natural selection, particularly with that type of time frame. Um, and you know, when, when a fire happens, you get millions of seeds. And it goes into the seed bank and it hangs out there and waits for the next fire. And the fire could be very local, very you know, distributed. So I'm not at all concerned about the mismatch of the complexity of those traits and the evolutionary time and the selection differentials that were necessary to select for it. And, and I'm also, I, mean, I just want to think, one of the things I've also, this is what this last PNAS paper is about, is that there is so much more embedding, phenotypic embedding in the genetic work networks that plants have. And that we totally underappreciate just how much compensatory responses uh, there are. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of changes of a key full of, handful of regulatory elements to switch things around. And I think this is what we're learning from plant breeding is that we're, you know, when you breed for a plant that is able to be, you know, highly yield producing in a particular habitat, it frequently doesn't involve a lot of genetic change to do that, even though it changes a lot of different things, frost tolerance and f phenologies and the, and the like. So a couple more questions and then uh, we'll have to close. I see a hand run up there. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, you talked very briefly about domestication and so indirect defenses. Do you, uh, do you know if domestication has changed uh, crops or in particular tobacco uh, and, and it, it, it produces less volatiles in general, it gets oh. less of the defenses? Yeah, yeah, th those are excellent questions. I, ha I haven't really studied cultivated tobacco very much. Um, 
I do know that cultivated tobacco does not respond very strongly to these FACs, and there's not much of an ethylene burst so that there's very little down regulation of nicotine when the caterpillar attacks them. In this plant, the, cat the plant down regulates the nicotine production very strongly when the caterpillar attacks it, and it turns out it's because there's a whole other story. The caterpillar is able, even though it's excreting most of the nicotine out of its gut through its digestive system, it sequesters a little bit into its spiracles and it has this defensive halitosis. It puffs, when it's attacked by spiders, it puffs out a little nicotine breath at it. Um, and uh, that, of course, is co-opted from the plant. So that's just one example of the things that we know are different between attenuata and the many polyploid varieties that we smoke. Um, as far as I can tell, when we domesticated tobacco, we were interested in leaf size. Um, very large leaves so you can have more stuff to smoke. Um, Nicotia attenuata, the word attenuata means small leaf, as attenuated leaf. And the Anasazi is actually, the, the Native Americans, there are five tribes, I don't, shouldn't use that term, Anasazi. Um, they, they didn't smoke leaves, they smoked uh, the capsules. Um, and the capsules have, are full of nicotine-rich trichomes and, and like. But um, I just haven't, I, I don't really find it that interesting to explore function in a domesticated plant because it doesn't make any sense. All of that genetic architecture in a domesticated plant has been dragged along by the artificial selection for yield. And it's all done in some crazy way. And sure, a lot of things will get lost, but a lot of things will be gained. And you try to make sense of that, it's like some scrambled, you know, idiotic genome. So I would much prefer to spend my efforts as a scientist working on a plant that I know is honed by natural selection, and it makes sense to be thinking about adaptive consequences of the particular architecture that's there. I'm not sure if that makes sense to you, but I... I well, in, in a way it would explain why we, we can't get rid of pests by domestication. We have a volatile... Yeah, yeah. And this would be easy to engineer back into crops. No, no big deal. They have jasmate signaling. You just need the receptor, and you need to tack it onto a couple of good volatiles. The predators will learn the volatiles. There's nothing in, intrinsic about those volatiles that attracts predators. It's all a matter of learning. We'll do a few more, and then there'll be a discussion tomorrow morning. You're welcome to attend for quite some time, but Dr. Baldwin will be available. So hopefully you can attend and discuss details. But I see a couple more hands go up, so let's, let's take a few more. Uh, first one I saw from back there. Please go ahead. These are excellent questions, and I wish I knew more. All I, all I know is that the Paiutes of Shoshone apparently burned the sagebrush to promote this, and that they traded the seeds. And you can definitely find genotypes along the trading marker that are coming out of Utah and going up to Washington, Washington State. Um, but aside from that, I don't think there's really much cultivation going on other than burning the sagebrush and having this natural fire stick. So I don't, th I don't think there's been a lot of direct selection of the native, they weren't cultivating it in the, in the standard sense and selecting for traits that were important. The plant makes godzillion amounts of nicotine. They didn't need to do anything more than smoke it um, for the purposes that they were using it for. So, but it's a great question. And I think that for um, plants that are making other sorts of things that are domesticated, you have a, that is a much a more important concern. Um, um. Great, great question, thanks. Uh, I have one there, and then last one to the people. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm just interested to know uh, if you are, uh, so you are utilizing your uh, water plant against insects, right? I was interested to know, like, if you are utilizing them for plant pathogens like Pseudomonas syringae, which is a big problem in tobacco, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if it's not a natural thing that I see in Utah, I don't care. Okay, so um, Sermotus syringae is a wonderful lab rat pathogen that you use to elicit plants to activate salicylate signaling. Um, I don't see it as a pathogen in Utah. 
the pathogenic problems that we have in Utah are mostly Fusarium alternaria uh, fungal pathogens, and we know a lot about that. We have some microbiome papers that show about the plant is has a sterile seed. Once it germinates, it starts to recruit a microbiome. That microbiome is super important in protecting it against fusarium uh, root rots and things like that. And so it seems to use microbiomes to deal with the uh, pathogenic world, which probably evolves faster than when you have a 400-year life cycle. Yeah. It's an annual plant, but it really is a 400-year <laughs> cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But an ex excellent question, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the sort of temporal element you have, uh, the plant uh, transporting the sucrose to the roots. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so then at some point, how does it know that now is the time to flower? That, that's one element. And Excellent question. Caterpillars causing a change in the way that the flower is presented mm -hmm. makes it more difficult for the, the uh, moths to uh, get nectar and then that moth is inhibited from laying eggs, which will produce a new generation. I don't know how many generations of caterpillars you have. In mm -hmm. it, only one, yeah. Yeah, it's only one generation and usually only one caterpillar per plant. Uh, the plants, you know, only get so big and the caterpillar is a broadverse size thing, so um, they will wipe it out if there's more than one. So when, when the uh, caterpillar split, spit is no longer there, then the plant decides it's fine. They switch back to the, to the moth pollinated one. Yeah, so it's about six days of feeding will get all of the flowers into this hummingbird pollinated uh, scenario. And then if there's no more caterpillars feeding, they boom, switch right back again. That happens actually faster than six days. So, and it's... You don't need a nervous system. Hmm? You don't need a nervous system for that. You don't need a nervous system. No, it's, you know, well, you just need a jasmine signaling system to do that. And it's, you need to have a clock that you can hijack and stop that, you know, that waving behavior. Um, and that's, that's the main trick of it. Uh, um, you had a first question about the... The, 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 the Oh, yeah, so the timing of the... So that happens... Um, during, during a massive defoliation event, when the caterpillars are really stripping down a plant, that's when all of this sucrose that it's being synthesized by the stem and the remaining leaves goes down. And once the caterpillars stop feeding, then, uh, they, then you have the normal back to seed filling uh, structure, so then sucrose then goes back up. Um, it turns out the plant basically becomes a stem. As, as you might have seen, there were very brown stems there. And they were able to mature all of their seeds with no leaves at all. So the, the stem itself is photosynthetic enough, the peduncle becomes really fat, and the, fl and the flower capsule, the sepals, supply the remaining photosynthate that's necessary to fill the seeds. So what we're looking at is only when there's been a rain event, watering again, the roots get wet and uh, there's an opportunity to grow new flowers, that's when that carbon that is down in the roots gets mo mobilized back up again and uh, going. So it's in this sort of, it becomes basically a cactus. I mean, it becomes basically a stem. Um, and, then it, and then it just becomes a stem with flowers that it reactivates. Uh, so it, it gets about 10% more flowers from this reactivation response. So it's not a full tolerance, it's not a full compensation, but it, it buffers. Yeah, they'll have to do something, yeah. Thank you. Great. I'm going to have to close the session, but I was remiss. I wanted to make sure I do mention this uh, to describe the Bendelow Memorial Lectureship in a sentence or two. So the Dr. Victor M. Bendelow Memorial Lectureship was created through a, be a bequest to bring internationally distinguished lecturers to deliver seminars in the field of plant science and to share their knowledge with students and staff at the university, and no doubt we have that today. So once again, join me in uh, thanking Dr. Victor.